Hello, everybody. We are back with the Paddock Chat, and I am joined by my co-host, Kirsty Shelts. How are things? Yeah, really good. So All happy good. to be back for our second podcast. I know, second one already in the bag. <laughs> and today we have got Joe Tomlinson joining us. How's yes. tricks? I mean, it's been better, isn't it? As a Manchester United football fan, football-wise, football-wise, yeah. and, and life-wise, great. But life is good. Man United-wise, <laughs> deary me. We're gonna try and be as positive as we can be <laughs> yeah. but if you can't do it then don't yeah. worry we, we we understand i mean obviously we've got to talk about the most recent announcement of a certain bald-headed manager yes. another bald-headed manager in manchester they love it, mm. don't they? yeah it's going to be a very interesting <laughs> derby next season mm. battle of the baldies isn't it but um <laughs> I have to ask, were you team Pochettino or were you team Ten Hag? Because it was splitting a lot mm. of um, opinions. There was a lot of arguments going on about, you know, Pochettino having that Premier League experience. Ten Hag's not going to have a chance in hell because yeah. he's not got the Premier League experience. Mm. Who's won trophies? Who hasn't? Where did you lie with it? I was bang on the fence, to be honest with you. Mm. I think there was um, really good cases to be made for for, for each manager. Yeah. Um, I think Ten Hag is like the shiny new toy, right? So everybody is kind of thinking, oh, we've got to go with the shiny new toy. Like, he's exciting. He's a little bit unknown, which I think helps his cause as well. Um, but I think some of the disrespect shown towards Mauricio Pochettino was, was going a bit too far too. I think he's still an extremely good coach. And if he is let go by PSG, obviously that seems to be the, the chat of the last couple of days. I would not be surprised at all to see a Real Madrid or somebody like that pick him up in the summer. Um, I think he's really really underrated at this stage because he's in a cesspit of PSG which is a bit like Manchester United mm. where every manager gets swallowed up like Tuchel gets swallowed up Carlo got swallowed up Unai mm. Emery three of the Champions League semi semi-finalists or quarter-final managers were ex-PSG bosses mm. so I think just because he hasn't won a Champions League at PSG and, and kind of stumbled in his first season at PSG some of the disrespect was a bit mad but um, I'm happy with Ten Hag I think it's it's a solid appointment um, I don't think there was a superstar candidate out there that stood out for the pack, it. is it? Yeah. So I, I, I'm very happy with that. It's not like exciting. Zinedine Zidane was sat there like, I'll just pack my suitcase because Manchester's where I want to be. But even then, would a manager like that I don't know if right I would have wanted Zinedine Zidane. I don't think I would have mm. wanted him. I'm, I guess I'm convinced. That, it wasn't going to be a long-term situation if we did manage to get no. somebody like that. And, but mm -hmm. I think no matter who who came in, it's a huge job. I yeah. mean, do you, do you think it's a case of Ten Hag now is in, he needs to look at it and think, I need to completely Real rebuild this or do you think he needs to put certain players to the test I mean I think he's going to come in I, th I do think there's an element of you're never as far away from success as, as you think you are when when you're in a really bad situation like this chat of like needing 12 new players I don't necessarily think that's the case I can't remember the last player that arrived at Manchester United and improved or got better v via solid coaching. Like, yeah. I think that is the base point, is he can come in and improve a number of the players that have been signed that are still solid players, but are just massively underperforming. Bruno Fernandes has had a really poor season by his own high standards. I don't think he's actually improved since he's been at United. No. Like, no. tactically, I think that is something Ten Hag will definitely look at, is improving a lot of the players that are there. I think there's definitely going to be four or five new players arrive at the club. Um, but... The idea of like ripping all of the squad apart, I don't think is is quite as needed as possible as people are saying because there's so many players leaving on contract. You've got eight players mm -hmm. leaving on free transfers or something. The the idea of selling another eight is just like it's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. And to think it is going to happen, I think is um, pretty clueless. I think United are probably going to shift those free transfers, maybe a couple of others if they can get cash for them. But then Ten Hag's primary responsibility, alongside betting in new players and new talent that he signs, is going to be improving players that have just stagnated or declined under poor coaching from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and Ralph obviously hasn't re really had enough time to get his boots under the table mm. with them or they're not listening to him at least because I remember um, Luke Shaw did a really interesting post-match <coughs> interview and he you could see he was so gutted he didn't even know where to start when he was yeah. sort of asked the question what's going wrong and he was saying there's so much individual talent but we're just not working as a team yeah so I think it's a case of as well someone sort of looking at the team and thinking right why are they not gelling well together um you know because you'd think someone like Ronaldo like would have completely lifted all the spirits but mm. it's just it's been quite flat hasn't it yeah well I think there's a lot of there's a lot of decisions to be made isn't there obviously behind the scenes that's the key area to fix before 
anything happens on the playing front like the the coaching staff has to be decided the technical director whether or not that's going to continue to be Darren Fletcher next season who's going to come in as as the deputy director of football whatever that role official role title is that they're currently in the hunt for who's going to come as Mm. that area of the pitch and like what's Ralph going to do that area of United has to be solved very quickly ideally before Ten Hag comes so when Ten Hag comes he goes okay here's my coaching staff he's obviously hopefully bringing Van der Gaag with him um, if he doesn't take up the Ajax like job mm. full time uh, but it seems like he's he's going to come to Old Trafford and then let's say it's Steve McLaren like his staff has to be nailed down I think that's been part of the problem for Ralph is mm. he lost his coaching staff um, and he lost the staff that left under Ollie and then he was kind of scrambling who's going to be my assistant coach who's going to do this who's going to do that and then by the time he arranged the coaching staff he was already in the job and then he was already up against it so I think First point of call is sort out what's going on behind the scenes, then sort your coach and staff, and then sort out the first team. And it's got to happen very quickly and very seamlessly because it's a it's mm. nearly impossible job. Mm, it's it's one of those as well because so many people are talking about how long is it going to be until maybe not even we get a piece of silverware, um, but at least we're competing for silverware. You know, I've been asked the question as well, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, I'm not even thinking about competing for, you know, the Premier League, for example. You know, in in my head, to be completely honest, like probably another five seasons, because Mm -hmm. you just think about how Liverpool and City, like the the level that they're on, and they're just going to keep getting better and better. And we're just scrambling, trying to keep up and trying to keep up. How long do you think Ten Hag should be given kind of thing? Do you think, you know, you look at three years and think, you know what, it's not working, get rid of him? Or do we need to think, you know what, we need to commit to this for a good, you know, eight seasons, for example, or whatever. What's your kind of thought process I on think it? eight seasons is a long old way away. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I think traditionally United have given managers plenty of time. Some managers have had too much time at United. I yeah. see a lot of chat online about United need to be patient with managers. United have been very patient with managers. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer arguably got too long. Jose probably got a little bit too long. What's too long in your head? Well, I, don't th- mm. I think a lot of United fans would have said that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was lucky to survive that Europa League final and then continue into the next season. A lot of people think he should have really gone after that. And yeah. Some people might say he should have even gone before. He like, was hanging on by like season. a string though, wasn't it? Yeah, there was a the number season. of times where he was hanging on then he managed to kind of galvanise an effort and, and went again. Mm. I think Eric Ten Hag just needs to think about just getting things right in the short term before like the long-term planning happens. That team right now is a disaster zone in so many areas that he needs to figure out, before we worry about trophies and stuff, I would much rather watch a team that is slightly in a lower position but has a very clear brand of football Mm. that knows exactly what they're doing when they go out onto the pitch and then can progress from there up the table. Mm. I think the idea of catching uh, catching... Um, Klopp and Guardiola shouldn't is even ridiculous. <laughs> like, let's be real. Until Klopp and Guardiola leave, nobody is winning a Premier League title. They, these are two of the best managers in the history of football, with two sides that are at the pinnacle of playing. Mm. Like Manchester City and Liverpool's sides right now might be the best sides we've ever seen in the Premier League. What will success be for Eric Ten Hag? Because some people, mm. as you've said, might be a bit unrealistic and think, well. Silverware is success, can't be. but is it just going to be a top four p- position next season? I think success for Ten Hag is even more simple than that. I think success for Ten Hag right is to way. develop a, a playing style that we can see as fans. I can't remember mm. the last time I watched a United performance and went, this is how United play consistently. Mm. Like mm. Even under Oli, it was like moments of individual brilliance, wasn't it? Rescuing us and then Bruno bailing us out or penalties, mm. defensively we were all over the place. Like I can't remember the last time... I sat down and went, this is the system, this is the structure, and this is who's going to play where. Yeah. Like, that is success. Just some kind of consistency and you feeling yeah. a little in bit more short comfortable term, watching a game. In the short yeah. term, that's success for Ten Hag to develop mm. something like that. In the long term, obviously, he has to challenge for trophies and silverware because mm. that's who Manchester United are. Mm-hmm. But in his first season, I would be very happy to see, you know, let's not forget that Klopp finished eighth in his first season. He was averaging like yeah. 1.6 points a game. But there was a clear shift of exactly how they were playing. Mm. And then within, I think, was it two and a half, three seasons, he was in a Champions League final. Mm. So let's get the short term right and then Mm -hmm. worry about trophies down the road. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I get what you mean. And obviously with Ten Hag, there's been 
a lot of talk about Ajax players and mm. some that may make the move over. And obviously, former Ajax players, you know, Frankie de Jong is being talked mm. about. Even a couple of whispers about Matthias De Litt as well. Um, are there any names that kind of stick out to you, um, either ex Ajax or current? I mean, there's a rumor today about Sebastian Haller. Um, are there any names mm. that kind of stick out that you think I'd like to see them? Or feels a little bit, doesn't it? It feels a little bit like journalists are going. Ten Hag managed Ajax. Who's at Ajax? Frank or, D- yeah, yeah Frank like, Young. Who, who with, can we yeah, pair can with bring? them? I'm not sure how much I believe these rumours. Mm. Um, Frankie De Jong would be a fabulous sign for Manchester United yeah. in that defensive midfield role. Let's have it mm. absolutely right. But Barcelona are also building a project there that's very exactly. exciting. Xavi's mm-hmm. spoken multiple times about how he wants to keep Frankie in the setup. Mm-hmm. However, they've got financial problems. Franck Kessier is coming in on a free transfer. Mm-hmm. Busquets is never ending by the season. <laughs> it just it keeps going, literally. And then you've got Gavi, you've got Pedri. It's a, it's a very compact midfield, isn't yeah. it? Um, and we saw him at the weekend against Ray Vallecano, 60th minute substitute straight down the tunnel. Like, that might have to happen to Frankie in order for him to move to Manchester United because I don't know that Man United is that appealing to many players that are playing for a Barcelona at the moment. Um, obviously, he's got the 10 hard links, so that might alter it, but... I, I'm not sure that United are going to be that interested in that many like, ex-Ix players. I think that's kind of a bit lazy journalism that's been put into the newspapers. Anthony, maybe. But again, like, is that just because he's an Ix player? Obviously, he's a fabulous player and can operate on that right-hand side where United have a clear hole. But do United go and spend £55 million on another forward when we might have to sign five players across the summer? I think it... I, I'm not sure that's entirely realistic. And it's the same with Urien Timber at centre-back. Do we ask Urien Timber at his age to come in to revolutionise Manchester United's back line? And I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit unconvinced about the ex Ajax and the Ajax player links, other mm. than Frankie Dion, who I think would be a fabulous mm. signing. How many do you, signings do you think that we will get? Because, you I think know, like, there's... I think he's, how I'm, many would you be happy when with? When Rannick said 10, I was just thinking to myself, it's never happened. Bit of a reach. Like, it's... No, yeah, absolutely. Bit, bit too much business well, it's to unrealistic do in, again, yeah, isn't it? It's not going to happen. Like, well. we've all seen United's business over the last couple of seasons. It's just not going to happen. Like, mm. I think a realistic number of players to bring in is like four or five. Yeah. If you're letting that many players go. And then you can try and reintegrate players that have been out on Unless Donny van der Beek, for instance, who mm. has had a proven track record on Derek Ten Hag of success in midfield and attacking midfield I'm sure he's going to come back in and will probably be one of the 10 players that Ralph was talking about Manchester United bringing back in Jimmy Garner will probably come back in from Nottingham Forest and be given pre-season at least to show whether or not he's up to the level Mm. Um, I think Brandon Williams too will probably get that opportunity if they can't then they'll either go out on loan again or be sold but Mm. I think of the 10 it's not going to be 10 signings I think you're Probably at least half of them are going to be either sort of returning loans or at, like assessed youngsters breaking into the first team. And when you speak about youngsters as well, an interesting one is sort of how much should he look at the youth team mm. at the moment? So, for example, if you look at who's been on loan, like James Garner, for example, yeah. it was a f- fantastic season at Notts Forest. Um, Brandon Williams, again, I mean, do you think these boys should be given a chance next season? I think they'll be given a chance in pre-season to to impress Eric Ten Hag. I think Eric Ten Hag will probably assess every single player individually, to be honest with you. Um, I I think it's, again, tough to ask Jimmy Garner to come into Manchester United's midfield and and have serious change. Like He could be a good squad player, but is that what you want your youngster to come in and do is under that sort of scrutiny, I think is really tough. United Mm. need two midfield additions, minimum if Paul Pogba's leaving mm-hmm. um, and I really rate like James Garner and I think he's going to be a fantastic player but I think it's a tough order to ask him to come in and, and have huge impact on that side straight away so I think in pre-season he'll probably be analysed and Ten Hag will make a decision can he follow instructions first and foremost which half of Man United squad seemingly cannot do at the moment <laughs> um, <laughs> can he follow instructions and is he technically good enough if those two align then he might Ten Hag might go yeah I can improve this lad really quickly and get him up to the level if not I'd imagine he gets loaned out again but there's some like players out on loan that have had our loans have been terrible yeah. mm. Ahmad at Rangers not work Jimmy Garner mm. has God, worked I even forgot about him actually <laughs> I know Ahmad out on loan at Rangers not worked Palestri no. has just not worked yeah. Yeah. at all has it because like, well, I remember when those two names came in and everyone was like yeah this is going to be the future of Man United and Axel, it's like Axel Tuanzebi has not worked at all not like at Napoli. all no. uh, Martial hasn't really worked in Sevilla I think he's no. a one league goal like yeah. so our loans have been either poor faltering or like a complete 
complete failure. Mm -hmm. So they've all got to be assessed um, by Ten Hag. Mm -hmm. But I just think to ask the, yo the, the young players to bail us out too much is, is a big Mm. It is ask. a big ask, yeah. It's a massive ask. Because we, we've spoken before as well about at the beginning of the season when you looked at the signings and especially yeah. when Ronaldo came in. I mean, we've arguably said that we thought this would be a fantastic season for United. And I think a lot of fans were so, so excited. You, you didn't doubt top four looking no. at the team on paper. No, not at all. Where do you think it's gone wrong in particular? I mean, there's so many reasons yeah. that mm. we could speak about here, you know, because... Even like you look at so many changes, you know, with Oli going out, it's it, it's hard, isn't it, to sort of then regroup again. But what do you think, in your opinion, has been some the of the main reasons? Million dollar question. I don't know. I I, I think there's just so it's, it's a myriad of of disasters. Isn't one it? thing like, after one another. One thing, yeah. and it's like things behind the scenes have gone wrong, and they've affected things on the pitch, and things on the pitch have gone wrong. I think if you start behind the scenes the exits of coaches and the reorganization of the backroom staff has caused problems without a shadow of Definitely. a doubt. When Ollie left and the coaches left around him, I think there was a reason that Rangnick wanted to keep those guys at the club. You know, your Kieran McKenna's and, and your Michael Car Carrick's. And I think them leaving caused a big problem for Manchester United. They had to panic to a level mm. to bring in coaches that aligned with Rangnick's new philosophy. He struggled to get his number one targets, and I think that was a problem. Obviously, Oli was a problem. That just was a total catastrophe. And then the players have just got no confidence. Mm. Like, they've just fallen apart mentally. Um, and I'm not sure, like, how easily fixed some of... I, I think some of those players' confidence has gone so low now mm. that they might not be salvageable for next season, mm. um, which is a shame because there are some good players that have just become, yeah, pants overnight. Like Maguire, for instance, mm. towards the back end of last season, we were saying... I remember Maguire when he got injured pre-Europa League final... Yeah. That was a disaster mm -hmm. for United. Like him being injured in that moment, the little clash with Cavani was a catastrophe yeah. because yeah. we were all over the place at the battle about Maguire. Then he went to the Euros and was one of the best defenders. He was the in the team tournament. of the tournament. He yeah. was sensational. And this season, it's just been problem after problem after problem. And his confidence has gone so low now mm. that it's going to be incredibly hard to retreat for Ten Hag. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we've got something like Cavani, who was a, like, superb for us last season, mm. huge impact for us. This yeah. season... It's been a bit has, strange, hasn't Hasn't been it? willing yeah. to put his body on the line for us. Mm, like, no. He got the cult yeah. hero tag way too quickly. Oh, yeah. Way too quickly. Yeah, Edinson I agree. Cavani. And this season has been mm. a disaster um, for him. I've been pretty disappointed by Ralph's... I like, was going to say... By Ralph's coaching, yeah. I've been pretty disappointed. But I love his honesty. Like, his honesty is... Like it's some watch, isn't it? As it's a United refreshing. fan, it is some watch as a United <laughs> fan. But the team is operating so badly. Like it looks like it doesn't believe in the coach. It looks like he <laughs> doesn't trust his system. The coach looks like he doesn't trust his players. No. Um, so coaching wise, I think that's been a bit of a disaster. That Ralph Rangnick spell. I think he's at about forty three percent win rate, which is just. Mm. dreadful do you feel like that's kind of like things were going wrong and things were snowballing and then obviously he came it's really in fault, and it? it's not his fault because i think he already had so much yeah. to yeah. deal with but do you think kind of like on top of that i think maybe people were optimistic that because there was so much talk about him and his abilities and what he's achieved that i think people were maybe thinking he's going to come in and at least improve things a, a little bit and do you think that it's kind of been a little bit of a, a failure from him or do you feel like you can't really I, blame him? I don't think you thing? can... Because as well, you're coming in question. and it's not your job. You've got X amount of months. There's only so this much This is the biggest problem with Rangnick is, is the idea of employing Rangnick it, like implies that you're going to go for a very clear tactical plan. You're going to press really high and you're going to give him all the tools that he needs to do this. But then you are immediately counteracting that by giving him a six-month six inter interim yeah. contract. Mm -hmm. So he's... Uh, he's uh, undermined from the get-go, really, Rangnick, mm. which is a disaster for him and his coaching staff. But I, I've i been a little bit disappointed by the lack of, like, do you know what? It, it's not working, but I'm going to play the way I want to play. Like, I've, all I heard in the build-up 
to his appointment and all I read was about he's got a very clear philosophy a very clear mm -hmm. back brand of football and I think if United had played that brand of football and that philosophy and failed United fans would have been happier than where we are now where mm. it feels like that philosophy is out the window it's kind of oh we're just like putting Scrambling sticking and plasters doing whatever, over yeah. little problems and we're playing in different roles and different ways I would rather have seen us like stick to a really clear like plan even if that meant benching and binning big names and mm -hmm. saying okay if you can't do yeah, I'm going to play 4-2-2-2 two, 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 high press if you can't do that you're not going to play and I'll play a youngster who can mm -hmm. do that like Alanga there's clearly problems behind the scenes he's talked about players not carrying out tactical plans I mean <laughs> Was it against, who was it against Liverpool when we played the three at the back and we yeah. worked all week in a low block and then mm. we're on the halfway line in the first minute? Mm. Clearly that's a problem, isn't it? They're not following his tactical instructions. But I I would have preferred to see as a United fan, if, the, if that player can't follow your tactical instructions, drop him and let's play somebody who can. Because so many I players have got saying. away with mm -hmm. murder this season and mm. keep on playing. Seriously, some of the players that have like had so much rope Tell, tell us who you're talking about. Tell us who you're thinking well, of. Well, I think <laughs> at, at times, like, both the fullbacks have struggled, haven't mm, they? Yeah. Alex Telles, at times, has really struggled. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, especially in this Ralph Rangnick system, I'm not sure it works at all for him. If there was one player you could pick that has sort of tried to put their body on the line, tried to give it their all this season, mm. who, who would you give that to? Fred. 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 I think I think Fred has proven that with actually I think this is one of the big things that te, um, Ten Hag can look forward to. I think Ted that Fred will play a big role under Ten Hag. Mm. I think he's proved he's pretty tactically versatile. I think with a proper coach he could be really good. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually think he's a lot better going forward than we've given him credit for in the past. He might not be the best finisher because he obviously takes some shots from ridiculous zones. But I think in and around the box, as he proves for Brazil time and time again when he plays with a player like Fabinho or Casemiro who sits in, mm. he can be a really good shuttling eight. And I think that role will be there under Ten Hag. Mm. And I think Ralph likes Fred. Mm. I, and you know, like yeah. in the past, we've we've almost talked about it as a bit of a joke, haven't we, Ollie? That became a little bit of a joke under under Ollie, didn't it? The sort mm. of you know McFred situation. Yeah. And I love Scott McTominay, but I think if you put an actual defensive midfielder alongside Fred, I think yeah. you can unlock some serious potential there. Mm. And he's he's a player who has put his body on the line, flown around the yeah. pitch in the Champions League. He was pretty impressive because there's very few. Mm. There's very it's few. slim pickings. Even definitely. even one, even our best player, our, our player of the season, in my opinion, David De Gea, I'm not sure works under Ten Hag. I this think has this been discussed a lot, hasn't yeah. it, about his goalkeeping style and what Ten Hag would maybe expect, and is that yeah. actually gonna gonna slot in? And maybe if he's not, is Dean Henderson gonna get a look in, or is he just gonna want to be out of the door? Which you mm -hmm. can kind of understand if because he he's does. gonna play De Gea and, under Ten Hag. I don't That's think United it. are gonna be able to afford number one to replace. De Gea and H Dean Henderson mm. with a goalkeeper that fits the system no. unless they go really brave which we've seen managers do before look at Pep when he came when he came in and he dropped Joe Hart people were saying people what's were going on here people were not happy, happy I wasn't it. horrified but <laughs> the decision proved in the long term to be mm -hmm. a huge success yep. um, and I think there's a decision for, te for Ten Hag to make around David De Gea I don't think it'll be one that's probably made this summer because I think he'll see De Gea as the player of the season a senior leadership mm -hmm. figure in the dressing room and back him but across the course of the season I think that might be mm. something that becomes a bit of a problem for United because at times this season the inability to get off the line uh, when mm. we want to play that high line on the halfway line you watch Liverpool do it or you watch City do it the keeper is 30-40 yards from his goal De Gea is still in his six yard box like we've got to get him up the field mm, yeah. and that might be down to coaching Ten Hag might be able to coach that into him but he's an old player to be coaching now I think it's fair to say what you said about Fred as well, because Rangnick was saying in his conference earlier that um, obviously Fred's you know got injury issues yeah. at the moment, and he's he's mm. still tried to train this week. Um, but they had a conversation, and Fred said like, "I won't be able to give 100 percent," mm. and at the moment 
I like I love this team. I don't want to go out there <laughs> yeah. and not be able to produce a hundred percent. So and get th- absolutely slaughtered by the media and fans, <laughs> which shows you know how much he actually cares and wants mm. to, to give a hundred percent every time he's out there as well. I think so, absolutely. Uh, that's one thing you 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 can't you can't say that he doesn't care because I think you can you can definitely see that he is passionate about the team and that he cares about what's happening on the pitch. And it's stuff. funny actually. Like I, I like two months ago, I interviewed Peter. Schmeichel and I said to him who's your favourite United player and he said Fred and Mm. I was almost like at that stage it wasn't quite when Fred had really like like shown what he's all about at United and I was a bit like oh Fred like that I think does that show where United are as a club but then over the last couple of months and I think if you were to ask Brazilian national team fans like who's how does Fred play for you 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 would get some really positive responses and I think United fans would give you much more positive responses now that he's proven that he can operate in a slightly different role under a different manager in Rangnick mm. than when he was under Oli because he was becoming a bit of a meme under Oli yeah. and I think it it's clearly proven that that wasn't correct mm. but I would say Fred is probably my biggest mm. positive of the season which it does mm. sum up where United are to a level you do your fair bit of interview and I think mm. it's safe to say and you talk to um, a lot of fans fans that you know of, of teams that you know you're working alongside in the industry and fans in general which set of fans has been giving you the hardest time whether it's people you work with or of actual fans has it been like the City fans that have been driving you mad or, or? Sure, most depressing I feel like we're at a stage now United where people are starting to feel sorry for us oh that's when it gets bad isn't it and that's they're when not you surprised know yeah like you know when there's you're, a look of pity you're in losing eyes. like four to, to Liverpool or five to City like I'm not even getting abuse at this stage which I think is now <laughs> you'd welcome that's, it yeah it's almost worse it is almost worse it's like pity yeah. we're, at, we're at the stage where we're like being pitied by other clubs which I think is just a, a terrible space to be in um, I actually don't think I've had that much abuse because people now expect United to be terrible mm. um so, no one's been rubbing salt in your wounds. I mean, Arsenal fans been... mainly. Arsenal fans. You but know that's what? mainly because I think United fans have hammered Arteta and the Arsenal project. Mm, and now yeah. the Arsenal we had project it has overtaken where United's project is. Yeah. Under I feel like maybe City and, and Liverpool fans, it's almost like we're not even going to waste our breath like, you know, it's having so a go annoying. at you because we have got such bigger fish to fry. Like, you're not even important to us. That's how it kind of mm. feels almost. Mm. Honestly, yeah. if you go to Man United's training ground and then you go to Cities or Liverpool's, it's like you're in a different world to where United are. Yeah. United are so far behind operationally that you would not believe. Like, even stuff like Cities, Reserve Team Stadium, United, like... Oh, we're at least Sports we're, Village. Exactly. We're, yeah. we're not even Which in the same... Which is a rugby pitch. We're not even in the same pitch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're not even in the same... Like, City and Liverpool... And it's like the other side of Manchester. Yeah, yeah. Like, Liverpool's training ground, when you go there, you would, you cannot believe where you are. Like, they've mm. got 10 training pitches that are on a 10-game rotating thing where mm. each one is cut to the same grass length as the opposition they're playing three, four weeks uh, down the road. Like, United is still playing in a training ground that's 12, 10, 12 years out of date. I was going to say, it looks almost frozen in time it's, sometimes <laughs> when I look United at Harrington. as a whole, isn't yeah. it? That's United as a whole, yeah. out of date, stale, believe in their own hype, way mm. too many egos behind the scenes. Going back to sort of the interviews that you've done in mm. your career, are there any interviews that, like, really stand out for you? Like, who's been your favourite? Oh. Or any United players in particular? Um, Not too many, like... At United, obviously, like Luke Shaw is a really good guy. (laughs) Like he, He gets battered by the fans at times, but... In terms of an interviewing character, mm. he's really got a good personality. Like, gives you open answers mm. and is, is a fun character. And the same was it, it could be said of Ollie. Like, mm. when you interview Ollie, he was very open. You can immediately see why players really like him. And I think United you know, have a lot of personalities like that mm. in the squad. Mm. You know, Jesse Lingard is a great personality to interview, and I'm yeah. sure he would be a really fun personality in the squad. I just wonder how many of the personalities in the squad have the cutting edge to like just serious mode. This is we are now like this is like wind time. Mm. Like I think there's a lot of like fun personalities. I think there's a lot of sort of um extrovert players that are big on social media and stuff like that and a Mm. bit quirky but how many of them are like serious win time players that can knuckle down overnight like like Kevin De Bruyne I never see him 
doing anything really that fun. He's just like, okay, I'm here to win. That's what I'm going to mm. do. I'm going to here to win. That's my nine to five, and then I'm going home. Mm. Like if you watch like his TikToks he's started oh, to make yeah. recently, Kevin De Bruyne, <laughs> it's like comedy because it's just like a normal guy going about mm. his nine to five. Literally, all he does is win. That's all he wants to do. I think United have a bit of a problem with that. But yeah, I don't know. United, like, I really enjoyed interviewing Ollie. Um, mm. Obviously, he's gone now. Luke Shaw, very like, very funny, like. Uh, Jesse Lingard, very funny, but they're like the person as you would expect, aren't they? Mm. As well, we've got Chelsea coming up. Um, how nervous are you feeling? I'm not nervous at all. You just not even. I haven't been nervous for United all. game in ages because I'm so. Are you just like see you rocks up, see what happens, and it is what it is? It's not even that. I, I just I can't remember the last time I, I went into a game thinking you're not going to win. Like mm. I, like every mm. time I sit down to watch United, I think to myself. Oh, this is going to be a long night, isn't it? This is going to be yeah. painful or boring or like. Do you ever turn it off? I, I to be fair, I don't because I, I'll I, be I'm honest. Like up with, I I'm, did with the Liverpool game after the first half. That's probably. I did have. I, I had a few things to do. To be no, <laughs> I know I should prioritize United, but that was the only game this season that I have had to just be like, I can't mentally deal with this. I, I haven't turned it off, but it's just like I just. I'm not nervous because I know we're going to lose or we're going to draw. Like, against mm. Chelsea, if we get anything out of the game, it's a huge shock. Like, yeah. And it means nothing at this stage. Yeah. The season's done. We're if not going to get top you're, four. You're not one of these people that sat trying to do the maths and, like, you've given up. We're not going to get top four. We haven't yeah. been... We, 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 we weren't going to get top realistic. four. We weren't going to get top four a month ago yeah. because we can't, we're can't. we not playing well enough. Like, Arsenal are playing good football mm. and they went through a three-week dip, yes, but that's because they've got injuries and because they've got a young side without much depth, not because they've got no clear identity. Tottenham have got one of the best coaches in world football with probably the best pairing the Premier League's ever seen in Kane and Son, or, or one of, mm. uh, certainly top five. So we are not going to be able to compete with these sides because mm. we're miles off it. We yeah. are miles off it and people are kidding themselves if mm. they think Ronaldo is going to drag us out of games <laughs> every single week or Bruno <laughs> is going to suddenly start firing all cylinders. It's just yeah. not going to happen. Mm. Like At you this stage, at player. this stage against Chelsea, I would rather Rangnick went, okay, who is leaving the club in the summer? Who is our contract? You're all out of the squad mm. and put young players in there and go, okay, we're going to play we know Ten Hag is going to come in, likely play a 4 2 3. We're going to play 4 2 3 1. Hannibal's going to play. Garnacho's going to play. We're going to play the players that have a future at the club. We're not going to get top four. I don't want to see Matic. I, if I see Wan Mata come on the club, onto the pitch again, <laughs> like, lovely guys, I'm sure. And clearly, Matic has been a leader, and Wan Mata is obviously a fantastic bloke. But it, they're leaving. How would you rate Chelsea's season then? Uh. Because, like you touched on, you There's know, you caveats, expected you expected Chelsea yeah. to kind of be keeping up with City and Liverpool, and they've not been able to do that. Obviously, yeah. there's been stuff that's happened off Absolutely, the pitch as well. Yeah, but I mean, in the in, in the league, they've had an incredibly disappointing season. There's yeah. no getting around that. They were expected to challenge for a title, and they haven't been able to do that. Mm. Um, and you know, I was one of the people that thought Romelu Lukaku was going to come in and hit the ground running in that Chelsea side after they won the Champions League and put them right up in contention with City and Liverpool. Mm. It's not happened. It's almost impossible to keep pace with Liverpool and, and City, I understand. But mm. Chelsea have had a disappointing season domestically in the league. But they could still leave with two trophies. You know, if two, two quins a season... Like, if two quins a season with an FA Cup and a Club World Cup, people are not going to be saying it's been a disaster. No. no. It's been an OK season with trophies and it's been probably a bit disappointing in Europe they should really have beaten Madrid over those two legs and then it's definitely been a disappointing season in the Premier League but mm. they've had to deal with some disastrous things going yeah. on at Chelsea I mean you thought it was yeah. bad when the interview with Lukaku came out and it was I mean I, I thought that was like pretty bad yeah, and then the stuff that's happened after that it's got even worse he's had the Lukaku yeah. injury he's had Reese James tearing his hamstring out yeah. for three months he's had Ben Chilwell his starting left back out for the entire yeah. season he's had an ownership disaster mm. where it's all fallen apart can't afford to pay wages can't have fans in the, in the stadium I think they can still only have season ticket holders in there yeah. his back four are all leaving you know Rudy's mm. gone Madrid Christensen's going Barca Azpilicueta's out of contract like They've not had it easy either, yeah. but they've got a coach in there who's got a very clear idea of exactly how they're going to play. Mm. And, you know, Reese James is injured, as Poliquet is going to play in that role. Kante's injured. 
Loftus Cheek's going to play in that role. Loftus Cheek might not be good enough to play in that role at the elite level, but you know exactly where he's going to play, mm. and you know exactly what the system's going to be, and that's what Thomas Tuchel's been able to create. So if he leaves the season with two trophies mm. in the Club World Cup and, and the FA Cup, I think he'll be pretty satisfied because it's been a tough one as well. Mm. And taking all of that into account, do you think it's fair to say we won't bounce back after that 3-1 defeat to Chelsea? I just being, I would be incredible, incredibly surprised. Mm. I'd be incredibly surprised. Like, There's not a single part of me thinks that we beat Chelsea tomorrow. Because, I mean, who do you even look at and think... You know, sometimes you're looking and thinking, listen, if he has a good game, then you never know, or that yeah. kind of thing. Or you look at one or two players and think, if they switch it on, then maybe... I don't even feel like there's any players you look at and see that kind of inspiration in. Uh, I think Chelsea are all over the place at the moment as well, like form-wise, but you never know. Like Ronaldo might show up and the back line mm. for Chelsea has looked a, looked a little bit suspect, obviously, mm -hmm. shipping that many goals to Arsenal a little bit like we did. Mm. But I just see them scything us, like cutting mm. us apart. Again, you know, no Jaden Sancho, no Fred. I don't... I, there's no positivity for me. Unless I... The team sheet comes out tomorrow and I see, you know, Garnacho replaces Sancho, Hannibal's playing in the midfield. Mm. Uh, I, I would be like, oh, now let's, let's have a go then. Let's at least, I, I'm excited at to least, watch it. Yeah. Let's have a go. Yeah. But when I, I know what will happen, it will be Matic in central midfield and it will be Rashford out on the left and Alanga, which is n not terrible, but I just want a bit of excitement, man. Like, mm. get Garnacho in the team. Give him a run out. What's to lose? Mm. We've got nothing to lose. What have we got next? Brentford, Brighton, and Palace, isn't it? Mm, I yes, I think three. so. Yeah. So when you look at them, you'd think, well... It's so frustrating, isn't it, to be out really? of that game? Those yeah, games. exactly. You, mm. you, start, you sort of look at the last three and you think, we should do that, really. But now <sighs> sort of we're going into it, I think, just mm. get the season done. And look at those sides. Like, Brentford much clearer identity of how they want to play football than Man United. Um, even when we went to Brentford, I thought, and we, we won, was it 3-1 or something like that? I thought for large portions of that game, they were the much better side. And after the game, I remember Thomas Frank saying, how have Man United won that? And it was like a langer on the break, wasn't it? Breakaway goals. They were so dominant. Brighton under Graham Potter, way better identity than Man United. Way clearer vision of how they want to play football. Have battered us at times and we've like scraped results. So mm. even those games, I have no confidence that we get anything out of them. I think United play like a relegation side. Like When I watch United, I'm like, this is like watching Burnley. Well, it's like watching Norwich. There's, there's no structure. It's just yeah. like, oh, somebody do something. Um, so I don't have any confidence that I've beaten any of those teams. Even mm. Crystal Palace under Vieira, I think, look look a better side than United. Mm. Yeah. And obviously, it's very exciting in the in the Premier League. You know, looking at. Um, I guess as a neutral looking at you know the battle for top four and obviously the you know the the top spot. Where do you stand as a United fan, Liverpool or City? Not points or like who you think would win it. Who in yet? Who do you feel better? See who do winning? I want to win it? Yeah, I'd much rather City won the Prem and Liverpool won the Champions League. Same. I think like I mean if Liverpool win the quadruple. There's no doubt that's, that they are the greatest Premier League team that's ever played the game. There's well, absolutely it, no doubt. Is that going to be one of the greatest sporting moments? Yeah, it would be. Ever. It would be up there. But like, it would obliterate. You know, the, the talk of like the treble winning side. Is it as good as these sides? You know, these sides are putting up 95 plus points every season. They are effectively unbeatable. And if mm. they win a quadruple or a treble, then there's no doubt people can't mm. complain and say oh 99 was better 2008 was better no mm. they're not they're not better than these City and Liverpool sides if they're able to do that and the same can be said you know if City win they're not going to win the treble this season but if they go and obliterate the Champions League and then win the Premier League like I struggled to see the arguments that there's been a better Premier League side in history yeah. than, than City I know that United 99 winning the treble is like maybe the better achievement but yeah. the better actual side just mm. that they're just juggernauts these two yeah it's crazy. They're, they're unbelievably good. God, it's depressing. <laughs> so, big question. What are your predictions against Chelsea then? Um, <laughs> you so can have a head and a heart a one if you moment, want. It's a moment, isn't it, thinking yeah. of the predictions at the I moment. I think probably 2-1 Chelsea. I could, mm, I, I, yeah. I've got an image of Romelu Lukaku scoring against United there. Like, he hasn't scored all season. Where, where's he going to score? It's going to be Old Trafford against United, mm. isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. I, can see, I can see United losing 2-1. Ronaldo scoring potentially again. Mm. I was going to go for 1-0. Yeah. 
One of United, Chelsea. one of Chelsea. Mm. There's a lot of negativity. I in this feel room, like it there. could just be, you know, like another frustrating draw situation. And even mm. if it is a draw, we'd probably actually be kind of buzzing about it, wouldn't we? So I take a maybe draw. a one-one <laughs> draw, like the like the last one with Carrick. Um, when Carrick was at the helm, um, but yeah, maybe even I don't that know. that was a robbery. When I was at yeah. the bridge that day, and honestly, I was so hungover, and I was at the bridge, <laughs> and I was watching that game, just thinking to myself, "We are getting toasted here." Mm. And then, like the one mistake from Jorginho, Sancho scores. I think that might be his first prem goal mm. as well, or second prem goal, and like battered again for the next 30 minutes. Yeah. It's just like what, oh, even yeah. a draw there. It's just mm. lucky to get it. Yeah. And obviously there's so many rumours at the moment about, you know, potential sign-ins, mm. transfers, etc. So got a couple of um, quick fire questions Let's just to see if, if you would sign them yourself. To sign or not to sign. So to sign, yeah. So Darwin Nunes. Not to sign. Not to sign. I think um, I'd be happy if he signed, but I think the value is a huge risk. I think to be paying 80, 90 million euros for a player who is that yeah. age that has done it for such a short amount of time in the Portuguese league, although he has scored mm. some big goals in the Champions mm. League for Benfica this season. Mm. I just think it's too big of a risk. I think he's risk. a good player, but United... We need have, to know it's not a flash United have pun. got to sign five players this summer. We can't... I don't think we can risk a 90 million pound striker mm. who's had one good season yeah. in Liga Nosh. I think mm. it's a risk. So I'd say not to sign. Mm. What about the 19-year-old Hugo Ekatiko? Um Again, it's a bit of a risk, young yeah, player. Yeah. Obviously, I, you know, a lot of other clubs are after him. Or... I think it would depend on his valuation. We were seeing like 40, 50 million euros being banded around. I think Newcastle had 30 million euros rejected in January, didn't they? Yeah. And I think his value has only probably risen since then. Um, more of a, like... That's more the area that United are going to have to target. I mm. don't know if United will, fans will want to hear this, but I think that's more the area we're going to have to target. Yeah. The, the younger, slightly lesser known striker who is a little bit cheaper. Because, again, so many players to sign, you've got to consolidate value at some stage. Um, but I would probably, again, say not to sign. Mm. Mm. One particular player who has actually been spoken about for the majority of the season, um, I don't think we'll get him, but Declan Rice... I mean, sign, definitely, but not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, £150 million, pounds, there's just no chance United are going to pay that. Um, West Ham are fully aware that his value is going to be at his highest next summer. Mm -hmm. well, he's got, his contract runs to 2024 with an optional extra year. So 2025, if we're being realistic, he's going to be coming off the back of a World Cup six months prior. Mm -hmm. If he does well at that World Cup with England and he has a further two years left on his deal, West Ham are like... The banks are just Rubbing like, their yeah, hands they are together. absolutely buzzing. So I yeah. think it's, uh, I would love it to happen, but it's not going to happen. Nobody's going to get him this summer. And some people have also been talking about Calvin Phillips as well as potentially being mm. a good option. What's your Calvin thought Phillips being an amazing sign yeah. for United. International experience. Massively underrated player, Calvin mm. Phillips. He's better than any of our midfielders. And I yeah. see people on, at, at United turning their nose up uh, at him in the fan base online. Um, again, there's going to be issues, isn't there? Does he want to leave? Like he's a massive Leeds fan. He's a boyhood Leeds fan. Does he make the Culturally, jump? Culturally, it's the a big thing, isn't Absolutely. it? Yeah. It'd be like Rashford, you know, like because he loves United, yeah. wouldn't it? Same I think thing. the only I think the only way United get Phillips is if Leeds get relegated. And if Leeds mm. get relegated, I think they should be going for Rafinha, not Phillips. Mm. Like that's the player. United need a right winger. Mm. Phil, uh, Rafinha is the guy, and I think he has a 25 million release clause if they get relegated. So mm. I would be doubling down on Rafinha if mm. if they go down. Sure, many for me. United that should be United's number one target. Mm. Um, a midfielder that can do absolutely everything as well as a player like Eve Basuma. Um, I think Eve Basuma is an extremely gettable target in the summer for United. You know, he's out of contract next summer. If Leicester are pricing Tielemans at 25 million, Basuma will not be being priced at more than that in my, in my head anyway. Um, and for me, having spoken to a lot of footballers, the amount of players that I've spoken to in the Prem that have said the best player they've played against is Basuma is unreal. Yeah. Like yeah. Ne nearly every midfielder you speak to in the Premier League, who's the best, who's the toughest you played against? Mm. They all say Basuma. Um, and we've heard Rangnick just constantly bang on about physicality, physicality, physicality. Like Basuma is so physical in the mm. middle of the park. Uh, so I would like to see something like Basuma paired with a Shua Mene. Because um, you know, I need more than one central midfielder. Mm. Those would be my two midfield like gets. 
Um, and looking at centre backs, there's been you know a lot of rumours again about Paul Torres. Mm. What do you feel about him? I, I feel like I haven't watched enough Villarreal to mm. like have a serious opinion on Paul Torres. Whenever I watch him in Europe, I'm never that impressed. Yeah. Um, but he's he must have something because mm. he's you know very consistently talked about as one of Europe's next next best centre backs. Mm. He's very clearly by statistics anyway, an extremely good ball progressor and ball player. But I just haven't watched enough Mm. Power Torres to know whether he's physical enough for the league because I I think that's a big step up. And you also have to think, you know, why would you? I mean, I know, um, you know, looking at at Villarreal in the league and Manchester United probably kind of in the same position, like in the table. But, you know, Villarreal have arguably got a lot more going for him at the moment. And last but not least, Ruben Neves. Mm. Mm. No, not feeling it. Leave it. Um, I think he's a really gifted player, and I think for the right team, he'd be an amazing signing. I'm just not sure United is the right team. I mm-hmm. think United, again, not to bang on about it, but physicality is something United have huge problems with, the ability to get around the pitch and like get up and down in a pressing style. Doesn't, it's not Ruben Neves' game. Um, and at, F- at Wolves, he plays in a very structured system that allows him to dictate and distribute the ball. At United, where United are going to be hopefully progressing into this hypermobile pressing side, I don't know whether Ruben Neves really fits in there. Um, I might be disproved by Eric Ten Hag. Uh, we've obviously seen un- unathletic players, but players that aren't quite so sort of like physical specimens do really well um like look at Rodri in that mm. Pep Guardiola side um he's not the most physical player but I've just the metronome everything goes through him and Ten Hag might think to himself I want to replicate a little bit of what Pep's done mm. and I want to have that metronomic figure in there and if that's the case then he fits perfect but I would personally go for an Eve Basuma I think slightly ahead of him okay. I think he'd be cheaper as well yeah because mm. of the contract Well, that was very interesting to get your thoughts on that. So for the viewers, listeners, what else have have you been getting up to? What's been going on? Um, Got still some busy. Saturday social still on Sky Sports um, every every Saturday, 9.30. Football Daily, obviously on YouTube and uh, Twitch and Snapchat and TikTok and Instagram, all those good places. But um, yeah, Football Daily or you can watch my interviews on Sky Sports as well, just Mm. with, with footballers generally. I was actually just going to ask you, have you got any big names coming up? Um, yeah, we want an exclusive. I've got <laughs> John McGinn and Jacob Ramsey mm. tomorrow mm-hmm. uh, up at Aston Villa. And then I'm hoping to have Juan Mata and Nemanja Matic next <laughs> Tuesday. Hopefully they don't watch this. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, I was trying not to be too disparaging, to be fair, throughout that towards them. Um, so whether or not that happens will mm. remain to be seen because obviously United play games in between there and players can pick up injuries and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, John McGinn and Jacob Ramsey tomorrow. So mm. that should be out in a couple of weeks. Nice. nice one. Mm. Well, my up to yeah. next. Oh, BT Sport will keep me busy as ever. Yes. Good. <laughs> what would like to hear? Yeah. So Europa League and then I'm back on the rugby this week. Uh, yeah, this weekend. And then I'm hoping as a former swimmer to get on the Commonwealth Games this summer. Lovely. So we'll see how that goes once this season's ended. Mm. Got to stay oh, busy brilliant. throughout the summer. <laughs> brilliant. And where can everyone find you? Uh, socials, just Kirsty Schultz. Easy peasy. Mm, same with you, really, I assume. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As I always say, it's Angelina Kelly. Not many people called Angelina. So I'm sure if you want to find me, you can find me and stalk me. That's great. Um, and as usual, I am over on the TalkSport Edge app. But it's been lovely talking to you. Thanks for yeah, coming thank down. Thank you so much. It's been so great good. to meet you. And hopefully... Next season, we can chat and maybe we actually yes. got we can jump on the positivity train properly. Absolutely. How Eric Ten Hag's doing? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> fingers crossed. Thank you to everybody for watching, for listening. As always, make sure that you're hitting the like button, that you're subscribing, etc. To everything that we've got going on at Stratford Paddock. And until next time, we will see you all later. <laughs>